So hello and welcome to another podcast from National Inset Week 2014. I'm joined today by Professor Jeremy Thomas, who's a researcher at Oxford University and also the former president of the Royal Entomological Society of five days, was it? Uh, yes, five days ago I handed over the baton uh, to the new president, uh, Professor John Pickett at Rothamsted, uh, one of the great uh, insect biochemists, a worker on pheromones. So you're well known primarily for your work with butterflies, mm. and could you tell us a little bit about your career with these organisms and what you've studied with them? Yes, I've always been fascinated by butterflies since I was a kid, by their, initially by their beauty, but um, later on by their um, strange behaviours at all stages of the life cycle. The more you learn about them, as with so many things, the more fascinating they became. And in particular, I um, was concerned about the decline of many species and um, wanted to do something for their conservation, partly because it was almost completely neglected at that stage. Uh, and also because it appeared to me that um, butterflies and other insects were actually more in need of active conservation than many other groups. The popular perception at the time when I started was that it was exactly the other way around, that insects were fine, they could fly everywhere and there were loads of them about, but it clearly wasn't true and um, so I, I focused on butterflies as a fascinating group to study their ecology and their conservation. And the other thing was, um, I, from a very early stage, became convinced that the only way to succeed in conservation was that it should have a, a scientific base, that it was, should, it should be based on ecological principles and knowledge of what the species required. Now that sounds a rather trite thing to say, but again at the time, um, almost nothing was known about the biology of virtually every species of insect that people wanted to conserve. And um, as a consequence, most conservation efforts were unsuccessful. Very early on, I wanted to find out why this was. No one had a clue and um, do something about it. This leads us to your most famous example of your work, working with these blue butterflies. And this mm. uh, really tells us about how understanding the ecology and the behaviour of insect species can really help with their conservation. Now, could you tell us the, the story of the blue butterflies? Yes, I was put on the large blue uh, in particular at a very early age, in the middle of my PhD. I was, as it were, taken off my PhD, which was to study rare hair streak butterflies, because the large blue was rightly, correctly judged to be on the brink of extinction in, in the UK and would go any, any year. And the large blue was about to go extinct. It was one colony left, and it was a, a particularly iconic species for three reasons. One is it's always been very rare. Secondly, by uh, common agreement, it's a very beautiful butterfly uh, in the adult stage. And thirdly, they have one of the most bizarre life cycles in the insect world. The adult is quite normal very beautiful adult but it flies in the summer for a few days and it lays its eggs on wild thyme, the flower heads of wild thyme and nothing odd about that and there's nothing odd about the little caterpillar either that hatches from the egg, it simply feeds on the um, flowers and developing seed of the thyme. The really strange thing happens um, thereafter, it develops very quickly but it hardly grows on the thyme. So it sheds its skins very quickly and gets into its final stage of the caterpillar life. But at that stage, it's still only 1% of its final body weight. Uh, and at that stage, it makes the dramatic um, change in its life. It flicks off the flower head, settles on the ground and starts to mimic an ant. It mimics an ant in two ways. It produces secretions that mimic the sense of ants it produces other secretions that are food to ants, sugars and amino acids and things. And it also has the power to make noises that sound like ants chirping to one, or one another, just audible to human ear ears. So it sits on the ground and it attracts ants to it. And if it's a red ant of the genus Myrmica, 
which is the type of ant that it's mimicking most closely, the ant is suddenly tricked into thinking that one of its own ant grubs has escaped from the ant nest and picks this object up, carries it into the underground nest and places it with the ant brood because it thinks it's an escaped piece of brood. Whereupon the caterpillar changes its lifestyle altogether. It starts feeding on ant grubs and it lives inside the ant's nest for another 10 or 11 months, um, simply feeding on ant grubs. And it grows about 100 times larger um, or heavier during that period. And it even forms a chrysalis in the ant's nest before emerging as a normal-looking adult butterfly. But how did you use this behavioural knowledge to conserve the butterflies? Yes, the, the key to the conservation was in discovering that um, the large blue was a mimic of one species of Myrmica, not any species of Myrmica. And it turned out that in this country there are typically five very, very similar looking species of Myrmica ant that forage on large blue sites and forage under the thyme. And they'll all pick them up with equal readiness. And it's only when they've got them in the nest that the much more discriminating nurse ants say, hey, this one doesn't belong to this colony, and kills and eats it instead. And it turned out there was only one species of ant to which the large blue was adapted, that's called the Myrmica sabuleti. And it further turned out that Myrmica sabuleti had almost disappeared from all the British sites except for the very last one. And the key to understanding what was happening was that these ants occupy very narrow niches. They have very specific requirements. So the five different types, species of red ant that occur in the U in UK grasslands, one like very short turf, one turf that was just a very little bit taller, one that liked taller, shadier conditions, say five to ten centimetres, there's a bit of overlap, and, and so on and so forth. And the one ant that the large blue depended on required very hot conditions of short, dry turf on south-facing slopes. And what had happened, unrealised by conservationists, by naturalists, by farmers, by everyone who cared about the butterfly, was that land use had changed quite a lot. Um, many sites had been abandoned by farmers that used to be grazed and quite short. Nature reserves weren't being grazed too short because the wardens and people in charge didn't like to see the flower heads nibbled off. And this didn't matter too much until the 1950s when rabbits disappeared, effectively disappeared through myxomatosis. So most of the large bee sites had previously been abandoned by farmers or were nature reserves and depended largely on rabbits for grazing. And then suddenly they went, the grass grew up, there was a massive flowering explosion of flowers because they weren't being eaten off. But alas, in literally one or two years, it's, the growth is enough for the Myrmica sabuleti ants to desert and a new, almost identical looking species of red ant to come in and colonise the ground instead. But it was actually quite easy to reverse um, it as well by imposing uh, grazing, very specific targeted grazing on former large blue sites. The really sad thing is that um, by the time I had found this out, during that time lag of about three or four years between the initial discovery and really being able to put it into practice, um, the very last colony of large blues, which only had about 200 or so um, butterflies on it, the very first year I, I saw it, had already gone extinct for the same reason that um, 100 or 150 colonies had gone extinct in the previous century or so. So the species went completely from the UK? Yes, it did. Almost immediately, the decision was made that we'd try and reintroduce the large blue to the UK. This was a globally endangered species, so there was a certain responsibility to try and maintain populations in the UK, because if we get them here, they're of not just national interest, not just European interest, but global interest. But it wasn't easy um, because, first of all, we had to get the sites into what I considered to be optimum or at least suitable habitat. 
Then we had to find a suitable source site uh, in Europe when most populations had declined and in some countries like the Netherlands it had already gone extinct before we lost it as well. But And also it has different races that are diff adapted to the different climates across Europe. So it took a long time finding a surviving race subspecies um, genotype, call it what you like, of the large blue that would be suitable to the UK climate and UK conditions and was numerous enough to be allowed to take them and transport them to the UK. The bureaucracy was an absolute nightmare but it was achieved in the end <laughs> and um, to cut a long story short we found them in Sweden in the south, a beautiful island called Oland and um, there were strong colonies there and we were able to translocate a few hundred individuals to the UK and found the British colonies. So from extinction to reintroduction, where are the large blues now? What state are they in? They're healthy in the UK. In a good year, we have about 35 populations. We actually have in the UK the two largest known populations in the world now. The next step is to get it in the other four regions where it used to occur 150 years ago, 200 years ago. Restorations of sites are happening in all those regions and it looks, it's very early days, but it looks as if it's going to be a success in the Cotswolds. And then we're trying to get it back along the old Atlantic coast of Devon and Cornwall. It used to occur in that. And there was a very interesting little um, string of colonies along the southern edge of Dartmoor. Um, so we're halfway there. And um, I think in a few years' time, we'll see it back in all five former regions. That's fantastic. So what kind of organisations are there for, for helping with this, so donating money or uh, helping to volunteer work on these sites? Mm -hmm. A great many. A large number of sites are owned and managed by the Somerset Wildlife Trust, a few by the Gloucester Wildlife Trust. The National Trust is an absolute major player. Um, the Butterfly Conservation Society is becoming increasingly important. Um, the Clark Trust in Somerset, and so on and so forth. And finally, an unusual one, Network Rail uh, owns some of the sites, and in fact Oxford University, where I'm based, um, currently rent these sites. And in partnership with Network Rail and David Simcox, um, we've managed to design... Um, new colonies from scratch when new constructions have been required along the railway all along the southwest railway lines there have been landfalls and um, similar perturbations and they've needed major repairs over the last 10 years and that's given us a heaven sent opportunity to work with the network rail engineers and actually we've been able to um, play as it were with the surface to put different types of soil, different depths of soil, different um, contours for topography and create, create out of starting with limestone ballast, pure rubble, um, what are already proving to be one or two of the finest sites for the large blue in the UK. And that's a very exciting uh, project as well that I think is going to grow and grow in future years. So rail side areas can be valuable conservation areas as well? They certainly can, and not just for large blue butterflies, uh, for many, many insects and wonderful flowers and um, larger animals as well. So now, from research and on to the Royal Entomological Society, so as the president, how can you suggest how um, important the society is to colleagues, to students, and to just budding entomologists, the amateurs who just love insects for being insects? For beginners, there are, there are many things. There are activities that the society puts on, there are meetings, there are contacts, there are specialist groups where um, one people who are interested in one group of insects or one type of insects. It might be water beetles, it might be butterflies, it might be um, insects of woods or um, insects of agricultural systems can indulge their particular um, hobby. But also the society provides um, 
fairly modest, but um, uh, travel grants and um, small other grants, which they often make all the difference between a student being able to do a project, travel abroad or something like that, and or not do it at all. And when you get to the university level, there are um, student forums, which are very, very popular, um, student meetings, because very often you're quite isolated at one university in the UK, but this brings people together from over the whole country, and you meet a whole lot of like-minded people. There may be three or four hundred people there, and then at a slightly more senior level, um, there's something called the Graduates Forum, which meets once a year as well, sometimes twice a year, and has the same function. It, it brings a lot of like-minded people together to exchange ideas, to learn about each other's work. And it's terribly exciting, this is, because these are the new generation, the people who are going to make the big discoveries and they are going to be really important and useful in the future. So that's one end of the spectrum where it's really important, but increasingly... It's taken a lead role in what is commonly called outreach nowadays. Uh, and increasingly, a National Insect Week is, is one manifestation of this, a very important one. We're trying to reach out to kids. It's not so general as it was once. So we're trying to fill that gap by reaching out to schools, kids everywhere, and just to show them the wonder of insects, the beauty of them, the fascination of them. So you have both ends of the spectrum, the highly academic bit that's a focus of world research and dissipation of knowledge and solving real problems to, shall we say, introducing people to the delights and the importance to insects. And from those two ends of the spectrum, there's everything else in between. There are sort of semi-specialist hobbies and everything that um, people can indulge in and that are promoted by the society. Well, thank you, Jeremy, for your insights into the career of a researcher in entomology and also for describing to us how the society can really help us as students, as amateurs and as professionals. So thank you very much for your time. Great pleasure.